Okay, let's talk about, finally, the meaning of life. It's kind of a stereotype of philosophy that that's what we talk about, so I figured at some point in Philosophy 101 we ought to uh, read something about it. And the reading um, we're looking at is one by one of the greatest writers in history. Um, this is Leo Tolstoy. He, uh, his most famous works are War and Peace, which is a novel that uh, everybody who's heard of it feels they ought to read. Um, but it's absolutely massive and has like hundreds of characters. Uh, but it's supposed to be one of the all-time great novels. And the other one that he's famous for is Anna Karenina, or Karenina, I'm never quite sure how to pronounce it, uh, which is another great novel, uh, love story. Both of them uh, very famous and both of them hugely popular uh, when he was writing in the late 19th century. So uh, he was a writer, some writers are only discovered after their death and you know um, don't achieve fame in their lifetime. Tolstoy was not one of them. He was hugely popular. He was kind of the J.K. Rowling of his day, only with more critical acclaim. Um, so, he is a great novelist, hugely successful. At the time he's writing this, I think it's uh, shortly after Anna Karenina. Um, and it's, uh, he's sort of at the peak of his fame and success. Um, and then something happened to him, something strange, which was... Now, uh, I, in the questions on the quiz, I refer to this as a breakdown, and I think that's unfair, actually, and that's a little misleading, because I dislike it when people say about him, oh, he was just depressed, or something like that, as if it's some... Um, you know, something that he could have taken Xanax for or a, a little bit of Prozac and that would have set him straight. That's not the problem. The problem is not one of um, a hormonal imbalance or anything like that. Because after all, he's, uh, he's I would guess, around my age, um, about, you know, middle-aged, and he's reached this point at life never having had uh, any problems with this. It's not like he's a depressive personality. He's a very hard worker, he's very happy, he's doing what he loves, he loves writing and he's very good at it and people applaud him for doing it. It's sort of the trifecta. Uh, and he has a family with whom he uh, is very happy, he loves his wife and uh, he also enjoys farming and uh, has been able to use his success to buy this huge estate at Samsara, Samara. And uh, everything is going great in the in Tolstoy world until he has this moment where, so as he says, something st very strange began to happen with me. I was overcome by minutes at first of perplexity and then an arrest of life as though I did not know how to live or what to do, and I lost myself and was dejected. But that passed, and I continued to live as before. Then those minutes of complexity were repeated, oftener and oftener, and always in one and the same form. These arrests of life found their expression in ever the same question. Why? Well, and then... In other words, what he's saying is that he is confronted with doubts that his life has meaning. He's asking himself, what am I doing this for? Now, for most of us, certainly you, I imagine, um, this doesn't occur to us. We're too busy doing things to have time to stop and think about the point of it. You know, certainly people think, uh, think about the point of particular activities. Like, why do we have to read Tolstoy, you might, be, you might be asking yourself. Why, what's the point of taking philosophy? I have had many people ask. But 
what most people don't do is ask what's the point of living this is kind of the question that philosophers are uh, kind of notorious for asking in fact uh, the uh, French Algerian existentialist writer Albert Camus uh, who wrote a book called The Stranger that um, was enormously successful and won I think it was the youngest ever winner of the Nobel Prize for Literature uh, Cal uh, Camus said that that was the first question of philosophy was why not commit suicide uh, and it's not like Camus was um, was sort of a wallflower or someone who you know lived away from the world and was shut up in fact he was very handsome and athletic and uh, a great hit with the ladies apparently uh, but nonetheless realized that um, that you have to confront this question uh, what is your life for at some point and it happened to Tolstoy and it's all the more puzzling because normally we think you know uh, I my life isn't so great but if only I could be successful doing what I love or you know get the chance to do what I love um, and of course Tolstoy did that and not only did he get to do what he loved he was enormously successful at doing it had a happy marriage children he loved and uh, a hobby that he loved which is this farm so he's the person you would least expect to have doubts about it but he did and um, as he put it uh, uh, the question seemed to be so foolish simple and childish these questions but the moment I touched them and tried to solve them I became convinced in the first place they were not childish and foolish but very important and profound questions in life and in the second that no matter how I might try I would not be able to answer them before attending to my Samara estate to my son's education or to the writing of a book I ought to know why I should do that as long as I did not know why I could not do anything I could not live so it's sort of as if he's frozen he can't make himself do anything anymore because he doesn't know the point of it and then until somebody will tell him what the point of it is he just can't get motivated anymore and as he says all this happened to me when I was on every side surrounded by what is considered to be complete happiness um, this mental condition expressed itself to me in this form my life is a stupid mean trick played on me by somebody though I did not recognize that somebody as having created me in other words God uh, the form of the conception that someone had played a mean stupid trick on me by bringing me into the world was the most natural one that presented it to me and he tells this little story of imagining God looking down and uh, and sort of you know saying <laughs> he's happy now he's working his way to the top of his uh, profession he, he's getting everything he wants but just wait suddenly he's gonna reach the top of the hill and he's gonna look and see there's nothing and then laugh at him which is an odd thing to imagine um, now what so what's the problem well it seems to be related to the fact that he's gonna die and in fact everybody is going to die um, I don't know if the kids these days have heard of the flaming lips but they have a, uh, a, a song called do you realize and um, one of the lines is um, everyone you know someday do you realize that everyone you know someday will die uh, well Tolstoy realized it um, he said I could not ascribe any sensible meaning to a single act or to my whole life I was only surprised that I had not understood that from the start in other words it, he's surprised now that it took him so long to have this issue um, all that had long ago been known all that had long ago been known to everybody sooner or later they would come diseases and death they'd come already to my dear ones and to me and there would be nothing left but stench and worms 
All my affairs, no matter what they might be, would sooner or later be forgotten, and I myself should not exist. So why should I worry about all these things? Um, this is a... I think a lot of kids go through this moment when they encounter death for the first time, and it sort of knocks them for a loop. Uh, that, And I think that they have a, a sort of version of this, that they wonder, well, if, if I'm going to die, then what's the point of anything? Uh, now, I'm not sure how good of a point this is, though. Certainly, it, it seems to be real for a lot of people that uh, if you die and if you've forgotten, then why did you ever do anything? Um, that there was no lasting significance in anything you did. Uh, but that assumes that there has to be lasting significance in things you did. Uh, and that might be part of the reason why, uh, as we uh, go on, he says that uh, the people who don't have this problem, don't confront the problem that he's having, are the sort of simple folk, uh, or the real working class, as he puts it. Though They don't seem to have this issue, that they don't uh, pause and look at their life and say, ooh, what's the point? Um, but a good illustration of uh, how he felt is told by what is, he calls the Eastern story. I've heard this um, tale, this story told in different versions by different people. And uh, when he says the Eastern story, I think it's of Chinese origin. It may be a Buddhist fable. Um, the traveler who in the steppe, so that's uh, in Russia, is overtaken by an infuriated beast trying to save, him, save himself from the animal. The traveler jumps into a waterless well, but at the bottom he sees a dragon. Boy, this guy has a lot of bad luck. Chased by a beast, jumps down a well and, well, and there's a dragon at the bottom. He opens his jaws in order to swallow him, and the unfortunate man does not dare climb out lest he perish from the infuriated beast. So he's caught between a beast outside the well and a dragon at the bottom. So he's sort of suspended halfway down. Uh, and he clutches to the twig of a wild bush. So halfway down the uh, well, he's holding on to this uh, wild bush. His hands grow weak, and he feels that soon he will have to surrender to the peril that awaits him at either side. Uh, in other words, die. Um, but still he holds on, and he sees two mice, one white, the other black, in even measure taking a circle round the main trunk of the bush to which he is clinging and nibbling at it in all sides. Of course, white and black represent day and night and they represent time passing. So time passing is like uh, the mice nibbling through the thing that you're clinging to to save yourself from death. But the, the Buddhist fable has kind of a, a bittersweet, uh, has, has kind of a, a happy message that you can, uh, the traveler sees that and knows that he will inevitably perish, but while he is still clinging, he sees some drops of honey hanging on the leaves of the bush and reaches out for them with his tongue and licks the leaves. So in, in the Buddhist telling, this, it, it, it obviously doesn't, um, you know, shy away from the fact that we are all going to die, but says that you can take pleasure, uh, and sometimes the sweetest pleasures are in this moment of extreme peril uh, that you you know in your death you can still take pleasure in these sweet things but the kicker for Tolstoy is um, and I try to lick that honey which used to give me pleasure but now it no longer gives me joy and the white and the black mouse day and night nibble at the branch to which I am holding uh, on I clearly see the dragon and the honey is no longer sweet to me in other words He's obsessed with his death, and he can't get the pleasure out of life anymore because of that. Okay, so death is the problem. Um, but, you know, surely he, he hasn't reached middle age not knowing that people die. So why is it that it suddenly affects him this way? It's that it seems to have be... The fact that he's going to die seems to be robbing what he's doing of any meaning. Uh, he goes on that the 
the most important drops of honey for him were his family and his art, his, his love of family and authorship. Uh, so why is it that they're no longer sweet to him? Well, why can't he, you know, get pleasure out of his family anymore? Well, the trouble is, he knows that they're going to die too. So, you know, he thinks of, he's got to do something about his son's education. He's got to do best for his son. He's got to make sure that his son goes to a good school. But then in the back of his mind, he's thinking, why? He's just going to die. What's the point? In the end, we're all, we all go, as he puts it, stench and worms. Um, and what about his authorship? Uh, what about that? Uh, because after all, um, it's often said that uh, great writers can live on in their works. They become, they achieve immortality through their work, uh, which was the basis of a of a funny joke by Woody Allen. It's kind of sad that Woody Allen um, has turned out to be a, a perv because he had some great lines and one of them was, uh, he said, I don't want to achieve immortality through my work. I want to achieve it through not dying. I don't want to live on in my work. I want to live on in my apartment. Uh, but what Tolstoy says, he's, he says, um, art is an adornment of life, a decoy of life. It's like a little mirror that you hold up to life. Um, but, as he puts it, that little mirror became either useless, superfluous and ridiculous or painful to me. I knew that life was meaningless and terrible. The play in the little mirror could no longer amuse me. So he can't get pleasure out of his family he, because he knows they're going to die too. It's just painful to him. He can't get pleasure out of his art because it's just, if life itself doesn't have meaning, then this sort of mirror of life is just reflecting meaninglessness um, back to him. So he says, okay, I've got to find an answer. I've got to find an answer to the question, what's the point? What's the meaning in life? And this is where he, sa he says he's lost in the forest of human knowledge. So he gives another analogy. Uh, it's as if he's now a traveler in a forest looking for the answers. And it, there are two possibilities. One is the clearing in the forest of mathematical and experimental sciences like physics and math and basically what we call the sciences. Can they tell me what the meaning of life is? Uh, either they can, that's the clearings in the forest, or the forest itself, which he says the darkness of the speculative sciences. And I take him to mean there are things like philosophy, uh, because for, as he goes on philosophy, the speculative sciences are the ones that actually deal with the question, what's the meaning of life? And that's what philosophy does. Uh, well, science first. By abandoning myself to the bright side of knowledge, I th saw that I only turned my eyes away from the question. In other words, Science can answer lots of questions, but it can't tell us about meaning. That's not what it's designed for. You know, you can't put meaning under a microscope. So he says, science can tell me about the chemical composition of the stars, about the movement of the sun towards the constellation of Hercules, about the origin of species and of man, about the forms of infinitely small imponderable particles of ether, but it can't tell us the meaning of life. Um, in fact, if anything, what it tells us is that there is no meaning uh, because science can't discover meaning. So as far as science is concerned, there isn't any. And he gives this wonderful little quote, imagining science speaking to him. You are what you call your life. You are a temporal, accidental conglomeration of particles. The interrelation, the change of these particles produces in you that which you call life. These conjuries will last for some time, then the interaction of these particles will cease, and that which you call life and all your questions will come to an end. You are an accidentally cohering globule of something. The globule is fermenting. This fermentation the globule calls its life. The globule falls to pieces, and all fermentation and all questions will come to an end. So this is what 
this is the image we get of us and our life from science uh, that you know it's just random there's no purpose to it it's just stuff that happens we can tell you the rules that explain what will come next in any chain of events but we can't tell you why it's happening because there is no why it just does there is stuff this is what stuff does you're part of the stuff that's what science says the alternative, the speculative sphere, also uh, answers, gives very unsatisfactory answers. He says, what is the meaning of my life? None. Or what will come of my life? Nothing. Um, the world is something infinite and incomprehensible. Human life is an incomprehensible part of this incomprehensible all. That's what philosophy says. And one philosopher he refers to in particular is the philosopher Schopenhauer, who was also, um, Woody Allen was a fan of, uh, who's a particularly pessimistic philosopher and stressed the meaninglessness of life. Uh, probably not the best person for Tolstoy to be reading um, when he's uh, unhappy about his life. Uh, next, he contrasts um, the people who surround him. He's in the sort of literati, as it's sometimes called, the uh, or the intelligentsia. He's surrounded by rich and learned people. They go to big parties and they discuss important things. You know, they talk about literature, they talk about scientific theories. They're very brainy conversations. Those are, those are the people he hangs out with. Um, contrast and uh, and in what remains he contrasts their life and their experiences unfavorably with what he calls the real working class or simple men which seems a little bit patronizing in other words people who have to work for a living uh, of course he works for a living too but uh, have to work with their hands you know have to uh, that don't have schooling um, and what he says about them, uh, now in your excerpt to this, it doesn't explain that, um, Tolstoy characterized four attitudes that people have towards life, living in ignorance of the problem of the meaning of life. That's one. Ignoring it and trying to attain as much pleasure as possible. That's two. Admitting that life is meaningless and committing suicide, that's three. And four, admitting that life is meaningless but continuing to live aimlessly. So at the moment, he's kind of in number four. But when he looks at the common folk, he says they don't fit into any of these four categories. So he said, uh, or subdivisions as he calls them. Uh, it's not that they don't understand the question. Because, they, as he puts it, they themselves put it and answer it with uh, surprising clearness. So what answer do they give? As we'll see later on, it comes from faith. A kind of simple faith, as he puts it. Simple faith for the simple folk. Uh, so they don't ignore the question. They think they've got an answer. So they're not in the first group. Nor could I recognize them as Epicureans. Uh, now, you should have watched a short video uh, that about Epicurus that explained that people often misunderstood when people found that Epicurus was studying happiness and was about the pursuit of happiness uh, they thought of him as you know kind of a, he a hedonist in the way that it's used now that is a, a non-stop partier who's just all about pleasures of the flesh uh, and he seems to be Tolstoy seems to be using this the term in that way but uh, he says that the simple folk are not Epicureans are not living for pleasure because their lives were composed rather of privations and suffering than of enjoyment. So they have to work hard and it's, you know, not enjoyable work. Still less could I recognize them as senselessly living out their meaningless lives. So they don't think that their lives are meaningless, which the other, the last two options are. Admitting your life is meaningless and committing suicide or admitting your life is meaningless and living anyway. Oh, uh, no, and the last one is they regard it as the greatest evil to kill themselves. So they would never consider committing suicide, the simple folk. Uh, so looking at this, he says, well, 
they're the people I should be emulating, because as he goes on and describes later, people in his circle seem to be a sorry lot. Um, he said, in contradistinction to what I saw in our circle, where life without faith was possible, and hardly one in a thousand professed to be a believer, or where life passed in idleness, amusement, and tedium, uh, or struggled and murmured against fate because of uh, uh, because of their suffering, and the fact that the more intelligent we are, the less do we understand the meaning of life. He says that's what's going on in his circle. Um, it's funny, it's sometimes said, uh, you probably heard people say money can't buy you happiness, to which the response is, yeah, but I'd like to give it a shot. Um, but my wife, uh, before she met me, uh, visited friends of friends who had a place on Martha's Vineyard, which is an island off um, Massachusetts where enormously wealthy people live. The Obamas have a place there. And she said these were the sorriest group of people that she'd ever met. They, the, the, at dinner, the, the patriarch of the family talks about having a loaded gun kept in his desk for whenever he wanted to kill himself. And, you know, and this is, and they all, these were people who lived in luxury. They had a special faucet on their sink out of which water came at the perfect temperature for brewing tea. So, uh, and yet, you know, these people are suicidal. And there was, uh, she's, uh, my wife said, the, um, the son of the family had brought a model along uh, who he was dating. You know, this is the lifestyles of the rich and famous that we're supposed to emulate. And yet they seem to be sad and their lives are pointless. This is what Tolstoy is saying is true of his. But of the common folk, he says he envies them and he falls in love with them. And he says, well, what's your secret? And their secret is... Uh, they have faith, which he describes as irrational knowledge. Now, what's slightly confusing is that at first, this is a disappointment to him, because their faith, he is, is religion that he's familiar with, and that he has long since rejected, because he's too smart for it. As he says, this irrational knowledge was faith, the same that I could not help but reject. I I can't accept this because it, it's, it's too stupid for me. He says, that was God as one in three, that is the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Uh, it's a paradox. Um, the philosopher Kierkegaard said it's, it's what makes Christianity the most absurd religion, claiming that uh, God is one person, but at the same time three p people. It's paradoxical. They can't, can't be both of them. Um, the creation in six days, you know, resting on the seventh, devils and angels, and all that that I could not accept so long as I had not lost my senses. In other words, he's, uh, he doesn't say that he's an atheist, but he doesn't think that, he thinks that certain elements of popular Christianity are uh, obviously mythical. You see this in... Um, Actually, I'm more familiar with this idea in England because uh, the the church in England is called literally the Church of England, the the main Christian uh, denomination. And a bishop of the Church of England said that the virgin birth was obviously fictional. It was metaphorical. It's not real. So, you know, and, and this is this is sort of the view of intellectual Christians, of which uh, Tolstoy is one, that, you know, certain elements of the Bible are just sort of stories for the simple folk, and you don't take them literally. Another person who thought this way was Thomas Jefferson. Uh, I may have mentioned already, he had a, 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 there's something called the Jefferson Bible, Google it, uh, and it's a Bible that he owned, and he went through and he cut out all the parts that he thought were just superstition. And it was didn't leave all that much. Um, okay, there resulted a contradiction from which there were two ways out. Either what I called rational was not so rational as I had thought. In other words, you know, his uh, the 
the learning that had led him to this puzzle, or that which appeared to me irrational, which is the faith of the simple folk, was not so irrational as I had thought. And I began to verify the trains of thoughts of my rational knowledge. He says, in verifying the trains of thoughts of my rational knowledge, I found that it was correct, correct. The deduction that life was nothing was inevitable. But I saw a mistake. The mistake was that I had not reasoned in conformity with the question put by me. The question was, why should I live? That is, so in other words, he says, this is the real question. What real indestructible essence will come from my phantasmagorical destructible life? What meaning has my finite existence in this infinite world? In other words, what he's saying is the problem that his death has raised for him is that there's an end to him. And if there's an end to him, he says, then he is finite and meaning requires the infinite. For his life to have meaning, it would have to connect some way with the infinite. Um, and science tells him repeatedly and clearly that he is finite, that there's an end to him, there's an end to the universe. The universe will meet its end in, you know, a few billion years. So there's an end to everything. That's what science tells you. And that means, he interprets it as meaning, that he can't achieve meaning in his life. Uh, whereas the advantages of faith, he said, no matter how irrational and monstrous the answers might be that faith gave, they have this advantage that they introduced into each answer the relation of the finite to the infinite, without which there would be no answer. So how does faith make connect his life with the infinite and therefore open the possibility of meaning? He says, uh, well, suppose I ask of faith, how must I live? The answer is, according to God's law. What real result will there be from my life? Eternal torment or eternal bliss, obviously, heaven or hell. Both of which are eternal, of course, and of course God is infinite as well. So at every point it connects it with the infinite. Finally, what is the meaning which is not destroyed by death? The union with infinite God, paradise. Uh, again, infinite. So, if you're looking for, if you believe that meaning requires a connection with the infinite, faith can offer it. Science can't. Um, so, sort of, in, uh, all the irrationality of faith remained the same for me. So, he doesn't think, oh, this all makes sense now. But I could not help recognizing that it alone gave to humanity answers to the question of life and in the consequence of them, the impossibility, I'm sorry, the possibility of living. So, what's he saying? He's not saying that he thinks faith is true. He's just saying that faith allows him to live. As he says, it gives him the possibility of living. Or as uh, further down he says, what then was faith? I understood that faith was not merely an evidence of things not seen, and so forth, not revelation, all of these things that, uh, say, a preacher might say of it, uh, not the relation of man to man, not first God and faith through him, not merely an agreement with what man was told, uh, as faith was generally understood, that faith was the knowledge of the meaning of human life, in consequence of which man, man did not destroy himself, but lived. Faith is the power of life. If a man lives, he believes in something. If he did not believe that he ought to live for some purpose, he would not live. So, what's he saying? Literally, he's saying, you got to have faith, as George Michael put it, otherwise you can't live. If you want an explanation, you're never going to find it. What kind of thing gives explanation? What kind of thing gives you the truth? Science, or po and possibly philosophy. But the truth isn't going to help you. So, faith. That is, faith is irrational. Literally, it's a suspension of looking for the truth. That you've just got to feel that your life has purpose. Even if you don't believe it, which he didn't. Um, 
So it's sort of, he said, I've got to adopt a mindset like the common folk that who uh, can accept these monstrous claims and it allows them to live. They never would consider uh, suicide and as he puts it, um, compare with his circle. I saw in our circle where all life passed in idleness, amusements and tedium of life. Um, that's what life is for people in, you know, his rich and uh, literati set. Um, whereas the whole life of these people, the poor folk, was passed in hard work and that they were satisfied with life. Notice that really, you know, because I've worked, <laughs> I've worked in retail, I worked at the British equivalent of Sam's Club, and it didn't strike me that my fellow workers, or I at the time, uh, were satisfied with our lot. We were working for the weekend, you know. Um, it's true that uh, there were some good times there, and I, I got on with some people there, and I had friends there, and <laughs> they forced me to play Trivial Pursuit with them every um, every lunch break because I knew the what's the literature one I think it's the brown one I could answer those questions um, and I have ha reasonably happy memories of that but it's not like I think everybody I don't think anybody thought this is what life is about um, but this is Tolstoy's view I mean you might think that Tolstoy is kind of uh, romanticizing the simple folk. That is a definite um, pitfall that uh, the rich and the disconnected can fall into. Uh, but as he says, I began to love those people. The more I penetrated into life, the life of the men now living and the life of men departed, uh, the more did I love them, and the easier it became for me to live. Thus I lived for about two years, and within me took place a transformation, which had long been working within me. What happened with me was the life of our circle, of the rich and the learned, not only disgusted me, but even lost all its meaning. All our acts, reflections, sciences, art, all that, all that appeared to me in a new light. I saw that all was mere pamp... I saw that all that was mere pampering of the appetites, and that no meaning could be found in it. But the life of the working masses, of all humanity, which created life, presented itself to me in its real significance. I saw that was life itself, and the meaning given to this life was truth, and I accepted it. Uh, notice this didn't make his family very happy, he doesn't say this, but uh, Tolstoy became kind of like a monk and uh, gave away huge tracts of his wealth and his land. And it kind of pissed off his family. They didn't like this. Um, but uh, that was his solution to what was troubling him. Um, now, it's not the only solution. Uh, I should say that when you discuss the meaning of life, usually this is taken as... Uh, as asking, is there a purpose to what I'm doing? Is there a purpose to my life? And the thing that the simple Christian faith provided was, yes, it says that there is a purpose. It says your life is for something. And what's more, uh, death won't bring this to an end, but in fact will be a new beginning, uh, uh, the realization of this purpose, which is unification with God. Um, the way that the literature on the meaning of life goes these days is it says that there are two possible purposes that you could find. One is a purpose provided from outside, an objective purpose. I say objective because it means that humans are like objects, like these scissors. Um, Incidentally, do you say pair of scissors or uh, a scissors? My wife says a scissors, and that drives me crazy. I say it's a pair of scissors. Anyway, this is an object 
that has a purpose. It has a function. It's for something. It was made for something. It was made to cut paper. Um, on the objective purpose view of the meaning of life, we were made for a purpose too, presumably by God, uh, by our Creator. And therefore, um, we have a purpose too. Now, there are two problems with this. One, what if there is no God? This is why uh, the scientific revolution uh, and the sort of threats to Christianity, in particular the 18th and 19th centuries, were a real shake-up. And in fact, they resulted in a movement called existentialism. Uh, Nietzsche and Kierkegaard were sort of the start of this. Uh, and Nietzsche famously says, God is dead and we have killed him. Uh, but the existentialists, including Jean-Paul Sartre and Albert Camus, argued that there is no God, so therefore there, our life has no objective purpose. Now, does that mean it has no purpose at all? No, because the alternative is, instead of having an objective purpose, your life has a subjective purpose. That your uh, It's a purpose that you imbue your life with. So the And in fact, that's better, say, uh, the existentialists. If your life has a meaning at all, it should be l meaning that you find in it. Now, critics of this say, well, what if you find meaning in something stupid? What if you say, you know, building a, a, a life-size model of the Taj Mahal out of cheese puffs is my, um, is the thing that I find meaning, gives my life meaning. Um, if To the people who say subjective meaning is what counts, they say, fine, whatever. That's fine. Your life has meaning. It doesn't have to have meaning for other people. Um, against the objective meaning, the subjective meaning people say, okay, suppose God did create you for a purpose. Or suppose you were created for a purpose. Suppose you don't like that purpose. Suppose it turns out that actually von Daniken or one of those guys was right. And actually, or... If you saw the movie Prometheus, uh, Prometheus came out a couple of years ago and it's sort of a forerunner to the Alien movies. And the idea of Prometheus is that humans are the creation of uh, a superior alien race. So we're just like a science experiment of another race. And suppose it turns out that the aliens made us for food that we're like a breeding animal and they're just allowing us to get fattened up and every once in a while they uh, pop down and abduct some of us and have alien uh, feasts on our soft, juicy flesh. Would it make you feel good? Would you feel, ah, at last, my life has purpose because I'm designed to be eaten? Probably not, say the subjective purpose people, because you don't like that purpose. Everybody, uh, this is the subjective people talking, uh, everybody who claims that their God has given them a purpose, isn't it a miracle that their purpose is a great one? I always think of um, Judas in this respect. Uh, as you might know, Judas is the apostle who betrayed Christ. And if you read the Bible, one of the contradictions in the Bible, of which there are quite a few, is that there are two separate fates that different parts of the Bible describe for Judas. One of them is that he hanged himself, and the other one is that he uses the 30 pieces of silver that he gets for betraying Jesus, and he buys a field called the Potter's Field, and he's very happy with it. He's not, unlike the other story where he's so ashamed he kills himself, here he's not ashamed at all, and he's strutting around in his field saying, got my field, I'm happy, and he trips open and trips over, presumably in a furrow or something, and bursts like a ripe fruit and his guts go everywhere. Look it up, it's in the Bible. Um, so clearly a hated figure, and in fact in Dante's Inferno, uh, there are two people at the, the center, the, the, the worst circle of hell. One of them is Brutus, who killed Caesar, and the other one is Judas. So, obviously a reviled figure. But, if you go by the story of the crucifixion, it's thanks to Judas that humanity is saved. Because if 
Jesus had not been portrayed, then he wouldn't have been crucified. And if he wasn't crucified, he wouldn't have washed us clean with his blood, as he's supposed to do in Christian, in the, uh, the way that uh, Christians tell it. So, Judas had an absolutely vital role in the salvation of humankind. And without him, we wouldn't have been saved. Now, that was his purpose. And what's more, Jesus knew he had that purpose because he knew he was going to betray him. Um, would you have picked that purpose? I don't think so. But it's a very important one. Uh, do you think that Judas, on learning about it, thought, great, my life has meaning? Uh, I'm not sure. So maybe the secret is you don't look for a purpose. Maybe no purpose could ever satisfy you. Maybe you just have to be more of an Epicurean and just try to be happy. Uh, and live life without meaning. On that note, I'll tie it up. Uh, I'm sorry that the semester ended as it did, but in the time that I got to know you, you were a fun group, and um, I hope you enjoyed it too, and don't forget to finish your second paper.